Good evening and welcome to this evening's Naval Order of the United States Continental Commandery Naval History Virtual Lecture. Uh, I am Fred Passman and I am the Commandery Commander. Um, before I introduce this evening's special guest speaker, a uh, couple of things I wanted to mention. I mentioned it for the first time at our last lecture, but uh, during this year's uh, National Congress, I learned that the music you just heard was composed by former Secretary of the Navy, uh, J. William uh, Mittendorf, Jr. And uh, not only is he an author and former Secretary of the Navy, apparently he's a, a composer as well. Um, so uh, again, uh, I enjoyed that music. I hope you did too. And I wanna thank uh, our companion, Mark Wixom for having put together that compilation. Uh, the Naval Order's mission is to preserve, promote, and celebrate, enjoy our nation's sea service history and heritage. And we are one of the uh, oldest, what we call hereditary associations, uh, particularly associations that are dedicated to preserving our maritime history heritage. Our commandery was formed just uh, recently, 2017, uh, to meet the needs of companions of the Naval Order who didn't live close enough to participate in any of our geographically centered commanderies. Again, you can learn more at the commanderies um, website. And I'll ask Mark to post that up below here. Um, where we have information about upcoming events, we have a full library of now almost uh, 16 or 17 of our previous lectures. This lecture will be up very shortly after completion of the lecture. And I welcome you to, to tour through that. A couple of housekeeping items. One, uh, we'll follow uh, Mr. Hone's lecture with the question and answer section session. If you use your comment block on the right hand side of your screen, please ask your questions. You can post them at any time during the presentation. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll have that question and answer session. With that, I will uh, welcome Trent Hone to this evening's uh, lecture. Mr. Hone's a Naval historian and vice president of ICF International. And stand by, I'm going to ask you what ICS stands for in just a moment. Uh, he's an award winning naval historian and vice president with ICF, which is based in Fairfax, Virginia. His work is fueled by an interest in organizational learning and operational effectiveness. And clearly, the topic of tonight's presentation uh, is exemplary of that. Um, he's the author of Learning War, The Evolution of Fighting Doctrine of the U.S. Navy from 1898 to 1945, uh, and his article, U.S. Surface Naval Act Battle Doctrine and Victory in the Pacific, was awarded the U.S. Naval War College's Edward S. Miller Prize and the Naval History and Heritage Command's Ernest M. Eller Prize. Uh, his essay, Guadalcanal Proved Experimentation Works, earned second place in the 2017 Chief of Naval Operations Naval History Essay Contest. And if you haven't uh, read your last Naval History magazine, you'll find an article which is, dare I say, Cliff Notes version of, of the book that we'll be discussing the art of command this evening. Trent, welcome. It's thank good to have you. Yes, thank you for having me. Very happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about ICF. Oh, ICF, you, you asked what it stands for. It's Intercity Fund. Uh, ah, okay. we, were, we were funded initially by uh, a former Tuskegee Airman uh, who survived the war and uh, came back and, and felt that uh, you know, working to improve communities within the United States was an important, important goal. And we have grown uh, since, since the founding uh, in the late 40s to a, uh, a 
I think we're about 8,000 people now. It's a, it's a fairly substantial consulting firm, at least the arm that I'm with. We do a lot of work with the, with the federal government uh, to improve how they do things. And there's a lot of uh, domain expertise within the organization, which I, I really value. You know, I, I bring uh, expertise with regard to or, organizational effectiveness, like you mentioned, and, and uh, you know, how do we learn? How do we, how do we um, understand better what it is that we're trying to do and how to organize against it? Uh, but there are a lot of you know scientists and and other people who have uh, professional degrees in in a wide variety of domains, uh, and so we bring a lot of talent to the work that we do. Fascinating. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time now. I'll, we'll see how much time we have at, at the end. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn the podium over to you and look forward to to hearing what you have to say about your your latest book. Fantastic. Thank you. And we will show the slides here. There we go. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much uh, for having me here. I'm excited and, and uh, pleased to have had the opportunity to write a book on Admiral Nimitz. Uh, it looks at his wartime uh, command. He was dual-hatted, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, but also Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Ocean Area's Theater, one of the largest and most substantial Allied theaters in World War II. And I wanted to look at uh, his approach to operations and organization and leadership, you know, through the lens of uh, complexity, building off some work that I've done before it, it, to try to answer questions like, what does it mean to lead effectively? What does it mean to help an organization organize to, to try to uh, accomplish its goals? And how does one uh, person in a position like Nimitz foster the, the emergence of more effective uh, tactics or behavior within that organization. It's already being used, the book here, uh, at the School of Advanced Warfighting in, in Quantico, one of the one of the seminars there. I heard that a couple of weeks ago. So I'm very pleased that uh, the reception has been positive and, and people are already starting to find value uh, in, in the work. This evening, what I want to do is, is focus on a concept uh, that I have called uh, strategic artistry. This is, let me go back. Thank you. Uh, it's a building on the work of, of John Sumida with this term. So John Sumida in his study of Alfred Thayer Mahan argued that uh, Mahan had a, had a belief that naval officers in order to be effective needed an artistic sensibility. That is, they, they couldn't follow rote procedures. They needed a sort of standard regimen of practice that they could apply, but they had to be comfortable with improvisation. They had to be able to build off of that base of their experience and, and innovate. And I think that Nimitz was effective at this. And I want to look at three specific uh, themes that I think draw this out in, in a talk this evening. And the first is aggressive action, which Nimitz used to wrest the initiative from the Japanese and then maintain it once it had been, had been gained. The second piece is organizational uh, unfolding, which is a term that I use to describe how Nimitz adapted his organization, particularly its structure, staff structure, command structure, uh, in light of new information to secure advantages and then maintain that throughout the war. And then finally, I wanna talk about differing frames and I'm not sure it's coming through the, with the video, my, my own image appears to be over the last words, but uh, conflicting frames for war. Yes, exactly. Uh, because World War II in the Pacific is not just a material conflict. It's also a struggle over what the war means. What does victory mean and how to how to obtain it? And Nimitz was adept at using his skills and those of his commands to uh, tilt the playing field so that the war that the allies fight are the one is the one that they can win. Uh, and it makes that much more difficult for the Japanese. So first, getting back to uh, aggressive action, this, this main theme, and, and you can put me back up. I don't think I'll be interfering with any of the, of the text going forward. This is a, a theme that I developed in, in the book, Learning War. I, I called it a, a tactical heuristic that the U.S. Navy developed in the interwar period. Uh, and Nimitz embraces it. It's a concept that informs his approach to war. That's a particularly important early in the conflict, in the immediate aftermath, of Pearl Harbor, because the raid on Pearl Harbor is, it's a shock. I mean, it's a tactical surprise, of course. It was unexpected that the Japanese would assault Hawaii with such power, but it's also a, a doctrinal shock. 
the United States has aircraft carriers, but it, it had never put them in a concentrated force with the size and striking power of Japan's first air fleet, the Kido Butai. Right? It, it, they, they strike with six fleet carriers together as a single unit. And because of the Navy's emphasis on aggressive action, this attack not only damages ships, sinks, others, it, it undermines uh, the U.S. Navy's officer corps' sensibility of the kind of war that they want to fight, the kind of uh, morale that they have. So by the time that Nimitz arrives at Pearl Harbor in, in late December, 1941, the, the officers there are in a state of shock. That's how he describes them. And so one of the first challenges he faces is how to rebuild the morale, how to reinvigorate those officers and uh, inspire them with the confidence that they're going to need to fight the war. Nimitz says he has to rehabilitate them in, in his own words. And how he did this, I think, is, is a quite uh, useful story to examine. So. Nimitz knew he needed to do something unconventional, and he decides to retain the entire staff. He's inherited two staffs, essentially, those of the, uh, the prior fleet commander, Admiral Husband Kimball, as well as the interim fleet commander, Vice Admiral William S. Pye. And it, it, Nimitz uh, retains those individuals, which is unusual. Usually a, a new commander would bring his, his, his staff in, people that he had worked with before that he was familiar with. Nimitz doesn't do that, retains the entire staff. And through that, you know, that expression of confidence is an important initial step to try to reinvigorate their morale. And one of the officers who is retained, who's going to be quite important initially, is this gentleman, uh, Charles Sock, which is short for Socrates, his nickname, uh, McMorris. He was head of the war plan section on Admiral Kimmel's staff. And McMorris is very aggressive. He wants to strike back at the Japanese, and Nimitz does too. And so very quickly, they form an effective working relationship, and Nimitz begins to work with McMorris to draft aggressive plans that he believes are going to help reinvigorate the morale of the Pacific Fleet and disrupt Japanese offensive operations. Now, Nimitz knows this is important, not just because he believes it's necessary, to uh, take aggressive action to try to put the Japanese off balance to disrupt their, their offensive, but, but also because he's getting pressure from the new commander in chief of the United States Navy, Admiral Ernest King. And King uh, in late December sends Nimitz a message. Uh, it tells him to protect Hawaii and very close second, uh, safeguard the lines of communication from the US West Coast with Australia. But it also includes this statement, undertake some aggressive action, you know, to help morale, to improve morale. King knows that this is, this is necessary as well, right? Because the Japanese are advancing in the Western Pacific. They, they've cut off the Philippines. Uh, they have captured Singapore. Uh, in the Netherlands, East Indies are being overrun. And those lines of communication with Australia are, are being threatened. So Nimitz is wrestling with this challenge, how to take some aggressive action, how to help reinvigorate morale, and McMorris drafts a plan. It's refined in consultation with other staff members, and it calls for a raid into Japanese-held territory in, in the Marshall Islands. And Vice Admiral Wilson Brown, who is the senior carrier task force commander, is initially selected to, to undertake this raid. That's, that's who the plans are written for. And evidently, Brown declines. Uh, Nimitz recalled years later that his first pick for undertaking this initial raid uh, declined. Said it was probably too dangerous and, and didn't want to do it. So Nimitz turns to another officer. And when he is asked, when William Halsey is asked if he will undertake this raid, evidently he responds that he will go anywhere. And so the plans are adjusted. They're revised. Uh, Halsey and Rear Admiral Flank Jack Fletcher, who's also commanding his carrier task force, they cover a reinforcement convoy to Samoa with their carrier groups, and then they head north. The initial concept for the raid was relatively modest. Uh, McMorris's initial concept had been tempered by uh, Vice Admiral Pye and some others on the staff, but 
as pressure from the Japanese offensive in the Western Pacific increases uh, the anxiety of uh, the Australian Naval Board. And as Nimitz learns more from submarine reconnaissance about the limited Japanese forces that are available in the Marshalls, he orders Halsey to be more aggressive. And so the plans are revised. And on the 1st of February, 1942, Halsey strikes targets in the heart of the Marshalls, Kwajalein, Wochi, Taroa, and Fletcher hits targets farther south. In the initial plan, Fletcher was just intended to cover Halsey's maneuvers, but now Fletcher is striking himself as well. And he hits Jalowit, Millie, and Macon uh, islands in the Marshalls or Southern Marshalls in Northern Gilberts. Now, there's some, been some debate about the impact of this raid in the historiography. Uh, in Samuel Ellis, Elliot Morrison's history, uh, essentially the Navy's operational history, uh, he likens these, this raid and other early raids to flea bites on a dog, basically trying to suggest that they, they had very little impact. And if you look at them purely from a material standpoint, uh, that is largely true, right? No major Japanese forces are, are, are damaged or, or destroyed, but they cause the Japanese to hesitate and adjust their, their offensive plans. So Nimitz soon learns through code breaking and signals intelligence that the Japanese have held back one of their carrier divisions, two of their carriers. Uh, they didn't send it south when they initially intended. Instead, they held it back in Japanese waters to be ready to look for or to attack uh, Halsey, trying to, to damage the US carriers. And so as additional raids following a fairly similar pattern occur and more intelligence emerges, Nimitz gets a sense of how he is forcing the Japanese to react to these aggressive actions that he's taking. And so by, by mid-April 1942, he knows that they, he's forcing them to adjust. And he also knows that he's about to have an opportunity to damage or destroy a significant portion of the Kidu Butai. Signals Intelligence had revealed the Japanese order of battle for their attempt to capture Port Moresby in southeastern New Guinea by sea. And so Nimitz worked with his war plan section. Uh, McMorris had by this time gone to sea, but his subordinates who were left in the section had stepped into his shoes. And Nimitz produces a very aggressive plan. His intent is to bring all four of his available carriers together uh, in the South Pacific, thwart the Japanese offensive, and, and destroy the portion of their carrier force that is covering this move to invade Port Moresby. He takes this plan and flies to a prearranged meeting with Admiral King in San Francisco. And it, this, uh, from the evidence that's available, appears to be a transformational moment in their, in their relationship. The, the specifics of the conversation that they had about this plan uh, were not recorded. Uh, but King has been a little doubtful about whether or not Nimitz is the right person to command in the Pacific. In February 1942, a few months before, President Roosevelt had asked Navy Secretary Frank Knox for a list of the 40 most competent senior naval officers. And so uh, there was a board that came together, uh, some retired officers, other senior admirals were reviewed, the senior officers of the fleet uh, identified the top 40 and Nimitz was not on the list. So his reputation hadn't fully caught up to his skills yet at that time. Now, by April, King has a bit more, has a bit more confidence. He's given Nimitz a longer leash, but I think he's still surprised by the degree of aggressiveness that Nimitz is showing with this plan. King doesn't immediately approve it, but by the time Nimitz returns to Pearl Harbor, King has given his consent. Now, the plan doesn't work exactly as intended. Nimitz was unable to combine all four of his carrier forces. Two of them were under Admiral Halsey, Enterprise and Hornet, and they had just undertaken the Doolittle raid. And so they didn't, did not reach the South Pacific in time. So instead, Admiral Fletcher with Lexington in Yorktown fights the Battle of the Coral Sea and is able to win a strategic victory, force the Japanese invasion, sinks the small carrier Shoho, which is pictured here, and also damages the large Japanese carrier Shokoku. However, carrier Lexington is lost and Yorktown is damaged. And King uh, gets a message from Nimitz saying, you know, we cannot afford to exchange losses at this ratio. 
So Nimitz looks for another opportunity, an opportunity to secure a better ratio. And he finds it at Midway. Now, the specifics of Midway have, have been discussed at length by others uh, in other works and in other lectures. So I, I'm not going to cover all those details here, but I will relate what I think is most important to this theme of acting uh, aggressively. Midway, the positive outcome for the United States and its allies at, at that battle is largely a result of Nimitz's willingness to gamble, to embrace risk and take a chance, to be aggressive. So when intelligence starts to emerge that the Japanese were set on capturing the island, Nimitz immediately sets about laying a trap, brings Halsey and his carriers back from the South Pacific, brings Fletcher and Yorktown back. He sets over a hundred planes in and around the island, some of them are seaplanes, uh, a cordon of submarines to the Northwest. And then he's gonna place the three carriers that are available, Yorktown Enterprise uh, and Hornet off uh, to the northeast, a point called Point Luck. Now, initially, Nimitz wasn't even sure if Yorktown would be ready, and he, but his his aggressiveness, his his plan, assumes that he'll uh, go forward and fight for Midway, even if he has two carriers, even if there are only two available, even if Yorktown cannot fight. But Yorktown is repaired in time, very quickly, uh, repaired in Pearl Harbor, and. This is where uh, point luck becomes extremely important because, uh, and this was pointed out quite quite nicely in a recent article by John Parshall in a Naval War College review. I think it's called "What Was Nimitz Thinking?" Uh, point luck is far enough away that if the Japanese approach along the path that they were expected, then Nimitz could disengage. The carriers were not immediately within range. He could withdraw and allow the forces that he had positioned at Midway to, to fight to hold the island, uh, to resist the Japanese effort. However, if the Japanese approached, he could tell the carriers to steam west, to be in position uh, to strike. And so as the unfolding intelligence emerges in a way that gives Nimitz confidence that the Japanese will be where they are expected to be and when they are expected to be there, he tells Fletcher to take the three carriers to the west so that, on the morning of the 4th of June, when the Japanese carriers are sighted, the trap can be sprung and all four Japanese carriers, the heart of the Kido Butai, are destroyed in the battle. We can see, we can get uh, an inkling of uh, Nemesis' concept from a tactical thesis that he wrote in 1923 while at the Naval War College. And the precursors to Midway are here, right? Now, this time, 1923, the, the foundational elements of the tactical doctrine that the Navy will employ in World War II are being laid. And Nimitz is part of that mix. But the, the way in which he articulates them, I think, is exceptionally clear. You can read the words here, uh, and I'll highlight some of the points. Right? Great results cannot be accomplished without risk. You've got to be able to take a chance. Efficient fleets are never perfectly ready. And if you wait too long, you'll yield, you'll cede the initiative to an opponent who employs the capabilities that he has with greater vigor. And this perspective is crucial, right? Because arguably in June, 1942, the Pacific fleet isn't ready. It's severely outnumbered by the, by the Japanese, uh, but Nimitz is willing to take risks, to act aggressively and uh, to put the Japanese off balance through the victory at Midway. It, it changes the course of the war. The aggressiveness of, of Nimitz is very important. Now, how does Nimitz, as the war goes on, maintain the advantage that he secured at Midway, these advantages that he is uh, creating through his use of aggressive action? How does he organize his forces, both the Pacific Fleet and the Pacific Ocean Areas Theater? And, and I use the term organizational unfolding to, to discuss this and, and uh, encapsulate Nimitz's ability and willingness to adapt and adjust organizational structures to try to continuously maintain advantage. Uh, and it starts early in the war. Uh, an excellent example is that very soon after assuming command of the Pacific Fleet, Nimitz improved its ability to identify and act on new information, to, to learn by creating shore-based type commands. Now, type commands have been part of the Navy structure for some time. You know, there were type commands for various ships, 
you know, battleships, destroyers, cruisers, etc. type commands for different types of planes as well. And uh, the type commanders tended to have dual roles. So for example, Halsey was uh, the commander of the aircraft in the battle force. So a type commander for aircraft battle force, as well as an operational commander in command of a carrier task force. And so that means Halsey has administrative responsibilities as a type commander and operational responsibilities as a task force commander. Now, when the war comes, it's very difficult to maintain that, to, to do both jobs because Halsey has to be at sea and his staff comes with him and he it, it undertakes these early war carrier raids. And so Nimitz recognizes that this is a serious limitation. The commanders can either uh, act as type commanders or they can act as operational commanders. They, they can't really do both, they have to choose. And of course, they'll choose to be operational commanders you know, because that is, that is the priority. So what Nimitz does is he orders the existing type commanders to establish administrative organizations ashore. So delegating the work of, of the type command uh, and freeing the operational commanders to focus on combat operations. This allows the Pacific Fleet to continue to employ uh, learning mechanisms that had been introduced prior to the war. The, the Navy was very good at exploring new tactical concepts through uh, fleet exercises and, and other events. Uh, experimenting with new ways to, to organize and fight, and then assessing the results of those experiments and explorations and exploiting the best of those techniques and promulgating them in new tactical doctrines. And so the type commands, because they are now ashore and because they have the capacity to do that work, start doing this early in the war through action reports, and through other uh, documentation that comes back to them, they begin to understand and assess what techniques that the Navy had employed pre-war uh, are working in the early war months and which ones aren't, which ones ought to be discarded. In parallel with this, Nimitz also removes a layer of organizational structure from the fleet that had been recognized to be inefficient uh, if after essentially the, the destruction or disablement of the battle line uh, at Pearl Harbor, there was no longer a need to maintain a battle force and a scouting force. And uh, so, so Nimitz el eliminated those, those organizations, flattening the structure of the fleet, and again, improving its ability to evolve and learn. Another key aspect of how Nimitz approaches organization and command has to do with uh, how he approaches jointness. That is uh, collaboration between the services. The Joint Chiefs of Staff and the British Chiefs of Staff, which when they were together were called the Combined Chiefs of Staff, agreed that all the Allied theaters would be joint and combined, meaning there would be a single theater commander responsible for all the combat forces in that theater. Uh, and today, we have standard patterns for how to approach a joint organization. Uh, but in 1942, when these theaters were starting to be established, those, those norms didn't exist. And so different theater commanders were able to approach jointness or how to organize different services within their theater uh, in different ways. One approach was to establish a general headquarters with subordinate commands for each service, the Army, the Navy, the Army Air Forces, uh, and this is what General Douglas MacArthur in the Southwest Pacific Theater did. It's also what General Eisenhower uh, in the Mediterranean and then the European Theater of Operations did. But Nimitz approaches it differently. He embraced the Navy's historic emphasis on, on decentralized command and control, and also recognized that, that there was a need to be able to respond very quickly to potential threats across the Pacific because of the way uh, the Japanese carrier forces could maneuver around it. And so Nimitz pushes jointness down. It doesn't exist just at the general headquarters level. It exists at multiple levels throughout the theater. Small island commands like Samoa or Midway, for example, were joint, you know, a single commander responsible for all the forces at that island or, or within that command, re regardless of what service that they belong to. And this meant that they could react quickly, right? Because if there are uh, Army Air Force planes and Navy planes on Samoa, then the, the commander there doesn't have to reach up to higher command to ensure joint collaboration. He can just order it and it, and it will happen. And this pattern is applied at other subordinate levels. 
so for example, Nemesis Theater is divided into three major areas, the South Pacific, the Central Pacific, and the North Pacific. And each of those is a combined joint command. And Nimitz had to find subordinates who could operate in that structure in, and foster the proper kind of inter-service collaboration uh, to aggressively prosecute the war against Japan. Uh, this is particularly important in, in the South and the North Pacific in late 1942 uh, and through much of 1943 after the victory uh, at Midway. So uh, for example, in the South, uh, victory at Midway creates an opportunity to take the offensive and Admiral King recognizes this very, very quickly because the Japanese are continuing to push and threatening supply lines to Australia. So King orders Nimitz to initiate Operation Watchtower, which is the capture uh, of a Japanese airfield on the island of Guadalcanal, which isn't quite finished yet, and also an, an anchorage across Savo Sound uh, at Tulagi. And King <laughs> orders Nimitz to do this before gaining approval from his peers and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. King himself was also very aggressive. Uh, the operation begins smoothly enough, uh, the 7th of August, uh, 1942, but, but the Japanese respond uh, in force. Uh, there are numerous uh, aerial raids on the invasion forces, and then uh, the Battle of Savo Island uh, destroys much of the escort force, forcing uh, the Navy to withdraw and leaving the Marines isolated on, on the island. The campaign becomes an attritional struggle. There are numerous confused and violent night actions. Uh, there are two large carrier battles at Eastern Solomons and Santa Cruz. And both sides are trying to ensure that they can re reinforce and resupply uh, their forces on the island of Guadalcanal. But because the, the waters and skies are contested, it's difficult to do that. And, and it's difficult for either side to initially uh, gain the upper hand. There's a question whether or not the Marines can, can hold. And Nimitz's South Pacific commander, Vice Admiral Robert Gornley, uh, seems pessimistic. And General Douglas MacArthur in the, in the Southwest Pacific is, is pessimistic as well. He doesn't expect the Marines to be, to be able to hold. In late September, Nimitz goes to the South Pacific to observe the situation for himself. He visits Gornley in Numea. Uh, he visits Marine Major General uh, Alexander Vandegrift on Gu Guadalcanal, who's commanding there. Uh, and Nimitz is impressed with Vandegrift's determination and, and, and resolve. He, he tries to impress upon Gormley the need to collaborate more closely with the army and, 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 and reinforce Vandegrift. Uh, but after returning to Pearl Harbor, there is, uh, in, in October of 1942, uh, there's a threat of another Japanese attempt to retake the island of, of Guadalcanal. And Nimitz is uncertain that, that Gormley is going to be able to respond with the necessary coordination and, and, and aggressiveness to, to fight it off. He, he surveys his staff uh, and all those who traveled with him to the South Pacific to see uh, the Gormley and uh, their uh, vote in favor of Gormley's relief. And so Nimitz agrees. Fortunately, Halsey is already on the way to the South Pacific. He's uh, going to take command or his intention was to take command of the carrier forces there. Uh, but uh, Nimitz told him to, to take command of the entire area, the South Pacific area. Uh, and he assumes command and in his own words says that he, he had to start throwing punches almost immediately to, to beat off this impending uh, Japanese offensive. And, and it is thwarted uh, by Marines and, and soldiers fighting side by side on the island of Guadalcanal as well as um, at the Battle of the, the Santa Cruz Islands. And then there is another Japanese attempt after that in November 1942, um, 80 years ago this month. Um, but that is turned back at the naval battle of Guadalcanal. And so Halsey brings an offensive and, and positive attitude to the South Pacific that uh, allows the tide of battle in Guadalcanal to, to, to begin to turn. And one of the most important things that he does, not only does he you know, introduce a much more um, positive attitude, change the atmosphere uh, in the South Pacific, but he also collaborates much more effectively with the army. He develops a joint planning and logistics approach, and, and this transforms Guadalcanal from the site of a desperate struggle 
in the closing months of 1942 to a secure base for future advances in the early months of, of, of 1943. Uh, the Army's expertise at uh, logistics, their ability to, to plan more effectively in that domain is a key part of that. And Halsey's ability to find the, that collaboration and, and secure it for his area's advantage is an important part of the story. Now, in the north, there is also uh, fighting going on with a, a bit less intensity, uh, but the, the struggle is extremely difficult because the terrain is rugged, the weather is very poor. In June, the, the Japanese, in parallel with their attempts to capture Midway, had seized positions in the western Aleutian Islands. Uh, the islands of Attu and, and Kiska had been, had been captured. And because Nimitz has allocated the majority of his forces to the South Pacific to, to stem the Japanese efforts to retake Guadalcanal, uh, it's essential to have a, a joint and collaborative command in, in the North Pacific, uh, because it's, it has to rely on, on um, not just uh, Navy patrol planes like this, but Army Air Force bombers and, and also um, soldiers and, and amphibious operations. And Nimitz expected his North Pacific commander, Rear Admiral Robert Theobald, uh, to work closely with the Army to maximize the potential of, of the forces that were there. But Theobald refuses to collaborate. He doesn't establish a, a joint command. He doesn't establish effective collaborative relationships. And, and he delegates his challenges, the friction that he has working with the Army, upward to, to Nimitz. Uh, so Nimitz is pulled into plans for operations in the North Pacific. He has to work with the head of the Western Defense Command, Lieutenant General John L. DeWitt, uh, to organize and prepare offensive operations that will establish airfields at positions close enough to Attu and Kiska so that they can be um, isolated and prepared for, for recapture. Now, this is an inadequate situation. Nimitz cannot afford to be brokering the command relationships in the North Pacific. He can't afford to be the planning staff for that area as well as the entire uh, Pacific Ocean areas. Uh, but he found it difficult to relieve Theobald in part because uh, Theobald and King had worked together for a long time. They had, they had a well-established relationship. And so it had to get to the point where it was very clear Theobald wasn't doing what he needed to be doing uh, before Nimitz could uh, remove him from command. But eventually that is what happens in January 1943. And uh, Rear Admiral Thomas uh, C. Kincaid, you know, pictured here in a warm jacket, so this, this picture was taken in the illusions, uh, replaced Theobald and uh, Kincaid immediately sets about establishing a harmonious relationship with his peers in the army. He established a joint mess, he conducted joint planning. He, he met with DeWitt on the West Coast to ensure that they had a strong sense of how to work together in future operations. And Kincaid leads the recapture of Attu in May 1943, and then Kiska in uh, August of that year. Now, by that time, because Attu had been captured, uh, the Japanese recognized that their position on Kiska was untenable, and, and they had evacuated it. They'd abandoned it. So uh, Kiska was seized without, without a fight. Uh, now, with Kincaid and Halsey, Nimitz has effective commanders who can maintain the momentum of offensive operations in their areas, uh, collaborate effectively with the army, and introduce effective structures for joint collaboration. And so Nimitz now has effectively delegated to uh, these officers in the north and in the south, and he can begin, N Nimitz can begin. Uh, to plan for operations in the Central Pacific, where it is expected that offensive operations will be most fruitful because they can move most rapidly uh, because the islands of the Central Pacific are very small and the fleet will have lots of room to maneuver. Now, Nimitz starts that preparation in, in 1943. And as he does so, he's, he's facing pressure from the army specifically because although he's emphasized this approach to jointness that fosters collaborative relationship and stresses inter inter-surface cooperation, the army does not think that Nimitz's uh, command at its highest levels is sufficiently joint. They, they feel like it's dominated too much by naval officers and that the army isn't represented well. 
And so General George Marshall, Chief of Staff of the Army, King's Pier on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, wanted to see Nimitz uh, create a general headquarters. And uh, Marshall recommended that Nimitz be elevated to a theater commander, a fleet command be delegated to someone else. Halsey was uh, suggested as a, as a potential option. Nimitz and King were willing to make changes, uh, but they didn't want the changes to be quite that extensive. They, they felt like the fleet could be an arm of strategic decision, especially if it could win a major victory over the Japanese. And so therefore they wanted Nimitz to remain uh, it re retain his role as the theater commander and as the Pacific Fleet commander. Uh, but they did need to do something. So King suggested more clearly delineating the work done for Nimitz as commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet and as commander in chief of the Pacific Ocean areas. He could do that with two staffs, one for each. And so that's what Nimitz does. Uh, in September 1942, he introduces a new joint staff uh, picture that is, is here on the slide. Uh, and that separated the work done for Nimitz as a theater commander, as the joint staff, uh, from work as a fleet commander, the fleet staff, and uh, for, for the army, the army staff. Now, to make this approach effective, uh, to capitalize on the decision to have Nimitz as commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet and commander-in-chief of the Pacific Ocean areas, he establishes an unusual command arrangement in the Central Pacific. Uh, in the North Pacific and the South Pacific, he delegates everything to a, a joint commander. But in the Central Pacific, he wants to have more oversight of the operations. And so he'll work through his Central Pacific Force Commander, later Fifth Fleet Commander, Vice Admiral Spruance. He's pictured here walking with Nimitz. Spruance had joined the Pacific Fleet staff after the victory at Midway. And during their lengthy time together, it's over a year now, uh, they had developed a tacit understanding of how the offensive should proceed. They had numerous conversations, planning sessions, and they also spent recreational time together, walking and swimming. And Nimitz felt that shared understanding was going to allow him and Spruance to quickly translate tactical decisions uh, into strategic outcomes. Now, the, the third piece I want to get into is this idea of conflicting frames for, for, for war. And, and this will allow us to see how some of those uh, approaches, those techniques that Nimitz employed in terms of organizational structure with Spruance had an impact. Uh, we often see World War II as a, a material struggle, right? A, a conflict largely decided by the unparalleled industrial output of the United States. Uh, I think there are alternative ways to view it, um, especially if we recognize the fact that to, to win a conflict, we've got to convince an opponent that they've been beaten. Um, and this was difficult uh, with the Japanese because they had a, they had a different point of view. I, I've said that Pearl Harbor was a shock, and not just because of the destruction of equipment, uh, but because of the impact it has or had on the morale of uh, Pacific Fleet officers and sailors. It, it, this was very deliberate. Uh, the Pearl Harbor attack was the culmination of the Imperial Japanese Navy's concept of decisive battle. The idea that war would be won by a decisive clash of fleets uh, that convinces an opponent that a war is not worth fighting, That that crushes their morale. This is what the Japanese Navy had done to the Russians in 1905 at Tsushima, the, the victory that prompts the end of the Russo-Japanese War. And in the intervening decades, the Japanese built on that victory and they'd refined their theory. And, and the concept was the industrial might of the United States will be irrelevant if its citizens are unwilling to use it, right? If they, if they can convince the, the American people that their lives and a treasure are not worth a lengthy campaign required to extract the Japanese from their new won um, colonies in the, in, in the Western Pacific. Now, Pearl Harbor doesn't lead to the intended result, right? Instead, the, the American people are incensed. They call for vengeance and they willingly undertake the campaign. So the, the, the Japanese begin to adjust. They, they keep their focus on the moral element of war, uh, but they fail in their attempts at winning a decisive victory, right? The Battle of Midway, the Battle of the Philippine Sea, and the Battle of Leyte Gulf, these are all attempts to secure victory in a decisive battle. And, and one of the things that they shift to is now, um, if, if the decisive battle isn't going to be won, let's ensure that the island assaults that, that the United States and its allies undertake are as costly as possible, right? Make the Marines and soldiers pay for blood in every yard. 
this is very evident at, at Peleliu, uh, the which is assaulted in September 1944, and which inspired this painting here, the, the 2,000 yard stare by Thomas Lee. And it happens again on the islands of Luzon, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. The, the Japanese aren't trying to win a conventional victory. And instead, they're, they're trying to sacrifice themselves most dearly to exhaust the US public's appetite for war. Let's see the parallel to this is the, the kamikaze attacks, divine wind, you know, pilots doing their best to overwhelm the air defense systems of the Pacific fleet and crash into allied ships. Uh, these attacks begin in the Philippines in October 1944, but increase in intensity until they, they climax off Okinawa in early 1945. And the fighting on Okinawa resembles the worst of World War I's Western Front. It's, it's very slow uh, to advance, and the slow progress on the ground means that the fleet has to stay on station and can be subjected to these amassed uh, kamikaze attacks. Uh, the, the casualties at, at o o Okinawa are extremely significant. The Navy and Marine Corps losses in the campaign are 17% are of, of those for those services throughout the in, in entire war. So it, it would be a mistake to suggest that this, that this approach that the Japanese embraced was, was ineffective because it is having impact on public opinion as the war is is coming to its its close but it's not, we know now when it ended and how it ended but you know in, in April 1945 May 1945 that's not known that's still the future um, and as the Japanese engage in this campaign it's, it's starting to uh, expose the limitations of, 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 of the US nation's will to keep it going uh, but the Japanese approach doesn't work. And largely, it doesn't work because it's overcome by an alternative theory of, of war. And it's one that uh, we can see on display in Nimitz's Central Pacific Offensive. And that offensive is governed by the, the Granite Campaign Plan, which is intended to allow the fleet to move very quickly. Because the Joint Chiefs of Staff were interested in trying to bring the war to a conclusion in the Pacific one year after Germany is defeated. Uh, and when they were thinking about that in mid-1943, Germany was expected to fall by the end of 1944, a few months after the, the Allied forces returned to the European continent. And that means Japan would have to be defeated by the end of 1945. And, and granted, it is intended um, to help allow this uh, because it treats future operations as options that can be executed if the circumstances are right or, or discarded, if they're not, it, it essentially it introduces a kind of maneuver warfare at sea. I'm, I'm indebted to Marine Major uh, Ian Brown for, for that idea. He and I had a conversation the other day and he said, you know, I think what you're describing here is, you know, sort of maneuver warfare. I'm like, yeah, it's a good idea. I think, I think that's what it was. Uh, so granite couples the increasing industrial capacity of the United States uh, to an approach that gets inside of uh, the Japanese command's decision cycles. It keeps them off balance. It's deliberately uh, flexible. In, in the first opportunity to, to illustrate it, its advantages comes in early 1944. The Central Pacific Offensive had begun in November 1943 with the capture of the Gilbert Islands. The next objective was to seize the marshals. And Nimitz and his planners weren't sure where to strike. Uh, his operational commanders believe that it's necessary to take the marshals in two chunks, but Nimitz had promised King to do it in one bite. And uh, there was uncertainty about how best to do this. A carrier raid into the marshals took photographs of the asshole of Kwajalein, and that revealed a fact that no one had been aware of, that, that there was room on the island of Kwajalein itself to, to build a bomber airfield, which is something that Nimitz needed. And so if he made Kwajalein Atoll, the target, it would have everything he needed to seize. It had an anchorage in the Atoll itself, it had a bomber field on the island of Kwajalein, and it had another airfield uh, at the twin islands of Roy and Namur on the northern part of the Atoll. And so he told his operational commanders, we will go to Kwajalein, we will occupy that, that will allow us to seize uh, the Marshall Islands. Uh, they objected to the idea when they were told in December 1943, but uh, Nimitz insisted and explained the reasoning and part of the reasoning we can see uh, by looking at this slide, because this is what happens next. 
This shows the timing of operations as originally conceived in the draft Granite campaign plan and also MacArthur's contemporaneous Reno 3 plan. Operation Flintlock is the capture of the Marshall Islands. It was delayed from the 1st of January to the 31st to allow Nimitz more time to plan for the capture of Kwajalein. But after that, everything accelerates because Japanese defenses in the Marshalls uh, collapse. Spruance uses his reserves to capture an Weetok, an Operation Catchpole, uh, immediately and covers it with a large raid on the Japanese fleet base at Truk. In the south, MacArthur advances to keep up. He, um, he abandons the assault on Keving, uh, invades the Admiralties in late February, and then captured Japanese code books, give MacArthur insight into Japanese dispositions and create the potential for a more rapid advance. So he goes to Hollandia, Operation Reckless, weeks ahead of schedule, covered by Nimitz's fast carriers, which become the driving force for offensive operations in both theaters. Nimitz and his staff become central to operations across the Pacific. The Japanese abandon truck as a base and withdraw their fleet to Palau. That means it's possible to bypass truck and Mortlock. They don't have to be captured anymore. So the Marianas can be captured in June 1944, much earlier than anticipated, and then Palau uh, in, in December. So the Japanese focused on U.S. morale, Nimitz focused on the Imperial Japan's military decision-making, their ability to conceptualize and execute strategy. He kept them off balance with Granite and, and this approach. And this essentially tilts, tilts the playing field, makes it impossible for them to execute the kind of war that they, that they wanted to fight. Now, as the offensives approach Japan, it becomes much more difficult to maneuver. Right. These two operations toward the end of the war, detachment to capture Iwo Jima and Iceberg to capture Okinawa and other positions in, in the Ryukyus, this is where uh, the Japanese approach becomes becomes more dominant. Uh, maneuver now is, is, is much more difficult, uh, but it still happens. So Iceberg itself was conceived as an operation in multiple phases that would seize numerous positions in the Ryukyus. Uh, essentially to secure enough air bases uh, to accelerate the bombardment and, and of, of Japan and, and strangulation of, uh, of the home islands. And uh, faced with the intense Japanese resistance, both on Iwo Jima and Okinawa, Nimitz and his staff, here he's, he's seen touring uh, the battlefield at, at Okinawa, reviewing the situation there. Uh, he adapts and adjusts again. It's no longer necessary to seize so many different positions uh, because it turns out Okinawa will support all the airfields that are necessary, all the airfields that are intended. And so other uh, operations that would be subsidiary to the iceberg are discarded. Uh, their cost is not seen as worthwhile. So up to the end of the war, Nimitz is continuing to adapt, adjust, and maneuver. And now at the, at the very end, uh, there is a question of invasion. The Joint Chiefs of Staff were fairly focused on it. Uh, Nimitz tried to continue the ability to maneuver. He had an amphibious operation planned on the on the coast of China to further isolate and constrict Japan, and he was learning from intelligence that the the Japanese are you know amassing airplanes. They're putting multiple forces on Kyushu, the initial target of invasion, uh, ready to oppose it. And, and likely intending to turn it into something like the Okinawa battlefield, but on a much on a much larger scale. Uh, now, because of the way the Joint Chiefs of Staff had reorganized the command structure in the Pacific, Nimitz and MacArthur had to collaborate to plan an invasion, and MacArthur would be commanding most of it. Uh, and he dismissed a lot of this emerging intelligence. And one of the things that I think is quite interesting at this point in the war is. King is aware of this differing opinion between Nimitz and MacArthur. And so King prompts a confrontation. He packages up MacArthur's optimistic messages, sends them to Nimitz and says, you know, let us know what you think of these and uh, make sure to include MacArthur in your response. Now, before Nimitz can respond, the second atomic bomb falls on Nagasaki, the Soviets invade Manchuria, 
and begin to tear through the Japanese army there. And the emperor loses confidence in the Japanese military to ensure survival of the nation. Uh, at the same time, allied surrender terms have been slightly modified to ensure survival of the imperial house, the you know Emperor Hirohito's uh, regime. And uh, so he decides that it's time uh, to give up. And he moves to accept the surrender terms. So Nimitz doesn't have to respond. And we don't know what he would say, uh, but I suspect that he would have argued uh, against invasion. So uh, I know we're running out of time. Just to, to sum up, I, I've discussed three different uh, concepts this evening that I ref believe reflect Nimitz's approach to strategic artistry, aggressive action, organizational unfolding or adapting organizational structure and, and conflicting frames uh, for war. The idea that Japan and the United States enter the war with uh, conflicting views of how to fight it. And in the examples I've discussed, I think uh, illustrate this artistry of Nimitz and, and highlight how and why I think it, his approaches are worthy of emulation. Uh, so I'll turn to questions now and uh, we can have a discussion about those ideas. Thank you so much. That was really a tremendous presentation. Um, I've got about 20 minutes worth of questions I'd like to ask, but we only have four minutes before the top of the hour. So I'll kick off with this. And, and I think this is perhaps critical to, to Nimitz's art of leadership is how did he develop and exploit the talent on his staff for both strategic and operational planning? You say just a few words. He's we'll he, read the book for the rest. Yeah, he, he's he's very adept at uh, identifying talent, putting the right kind of people in the right roles. One thing that I thought was a, a, an excellent decision that he took early in the war was to to make sure that there would be two admirals in each of the carrier task forces, one in the carrier and one commanding sort of the escort group uh, in, in, a, in a cruiser. And uh, so to have more spare capacity, right, in case any one of them was disabled, the other could step in. This works very well at Midway because uh, Spruance is Halsey's cruiser commander. And so when Halsey is, is taken ill, Spruance can step in and take over command uh, of, of, of the carrier group. Uh, so that is that is one way in which you know staff is very explicitly developed uh, to, to bring up um, new leadership. On the joint phrase, you know, we, we know that there are some very strong personalities, especially a certain uh, general that was pushed off the Philippines and vowed to return. Um, <laughs> Did Nimitz have to really depend on Admiral King to handle that relationship or to manage that relationship? Or was he able to go toe to toe with MacArthur and see a meeting of the minds? Uh, he would he would go toe to toe, but but uh, it, it was it was tricky. One of the things that is uh, interesting about Nimitz's approach is he's willing to travel. He's traveling lots of different places a lot of the time. He believes in the value of face to face conferences, the visits with King on the West Coast, but also in uh, Hawaii and other places. Uh, traveling to Gormley in the South Pacific. Uh, one of the pictures I showed, he's he's on uh, uh, one of the Marshall Islands soon after its capture. Uh, so he's very willing to go to places and see people. MacArthur doesn't travel nearly as much. So a lot of the time, Nimitz is talking with one of MacArthur's staff members who has traveled, often uh, his chief of staff, uh, General Sutherland. Occasionally, Nimitz would travel to, to visit with MacArthur at one of his headquarters and try to work things out. Work, work things out there. So a lot of it was facilitated by you know staff conversations or conversations between Nimitz and one of uh, MacArthur's staff members, or a conversation between the two of them uh, themselves. I don't think uh, Nimitz relied on King to to manage MacArthur. Certainly, they would try to approach him from multiple vectors, right? Yeah. So through through Marshall from the uh, or up through the Joint Chiefs of Staff and down from Marshall to MacArthur, and then Nimitz to to MacArthur directly. Uh, but I think there was more reliance on that kind of trying to collaborate within the theater uh, than there was on sort of upward delegation to King to try to fix it. Great. We've got other questions, but we're right at the top of the hour. Um, again, it was a fascinating presentation. I'm looking forward to the book arriving so I can read it in the next couple of weeks. And uh, again, we do not have a final date or topic for our December Naval History Virtual Lecture. So I invite everybody to pay attention to the Continental Commandery website, the upcoming lectures announcement, the Continental Commandery's LinkedIn page, and of course, I'll be sending 
uh, an email as soon as we have that locked in. Uh, Trent, again, thank you so much for spending time with us this evening. It's, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed it.